Hello, my name is John Nagoski, and I'm a native speaker of English from Wisconsin in the USA. I would like to introduce to you my English reading channel with questions and answers. The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Wattles Chapter 4 The First Principle in the Science of Getting Rich Thought is the only power which can produce tangible riches from the formless substance. The stuff from which all things are made is a substance which thinks, and a thought of form in this substance produces the form. Original substance moves according to his thoughts. Every form and process you see in nature is the visible expression of a thought in original substance. As the formless stuff thinks of a form, it takes that form. As it thinks of a motion, it makes that motion. That is the way all things were created. We live in a thought world, which is part of a thought universe. The thought of a moving universe extended throughout formless substance, and the thinking stuff moving according to that thought, took the form of systems of planets and maintains that form. Thinking substance takes the form of its thought and moves according to the thought. Holding the idea of a circling system of suns and worlds, it takes the form of these bodies and moves them as it thinks. Thinking the form of a slow-growing oak tree, it moves accordingly and produces the tree, though centuries may be required to do the work. In creating, the formless seems to move according to the lines of motion it has established. The thought of an oak tree does not cause the instant information of a full-grown tree but it does start in motion the forces which will produce the tree along established lines of growth. Every thought of form, held in thinking substance, causes the creation of the form, but always, or at least generally, along lines of growth and action already established. The thought of a house of a certain construction, if it were impressed upon formless substance, might not cause the instant formation of the house, but it would cause the turning of creative energies already working in trade and commerce into such channels as to result in the speedy building of the house. No thought of form can be impressed upon original substance without causing the creation of the form. Man is a thinking center and can originate thought. All the forms that man fashions with his hands must first exist in his thought. He cannot shape a thing until he has thought that thing. And so far man has confined his efforts wholly to the work of his hands. He has applied manual labor to the world of forms, seeking to change or modify those already existing. He has never thought of trying to cause the creation of new forms by impressing his thoughts upon formless substance. When man has a thought form, he takes material from the forms of nature and makes an image of the form which is in his mind. Thought in thinking substance produces shapes. Man is a thinking center, capable of original thought. If man can communicate his thought to original thinking substance, he can cause the creation or formation of the thing he thinks about. To summarize this, there is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which, in its original state, permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought, in this substance, produces a thing that is imagined by the thought. Man can form things in his thought, and by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. It may be asked if I can prove these statements, and without going into details, I answer that I can do so, both by logic and experience. Reasoning back from the phenomena of form and thought, I come to one original thinking substance, and reasoning for it from this thinking substance, I come to man's power to cause the formation of the thing he thinks about. And by experiment, I find the reasoning true, and this is my strongest proof. If one man who reads this book gets rich by doing what it tells him to do, that is evidence in support of my claim. But if every man who does what it tells him to do gets rich, that is positive proof until someone goes through the process and fails. The theory is true until the process fails, and this process will not fail. For every man who does exactly what this book tells him to do will get rich, 
I have said that men get rich by doing things in a certain way, and in order to do so, men must be able to think in a certain way. A man's way of doing things is the direct result of the way he thinks about things. To do things in a way you want to do them, you will have to acquire the ability to think the way you want to think. This is the first step toward getting rich. To look upon the appearance of disease will produce the form of disease in your own mind and ultimately in your body, unless you hold the thought of the truth, which is that there is no disease, it is only an appearance, and the reality is health. To look upon the appearances of poverty will produce corresponding forms in your own mind, unless you hold to the truth that there is no poverty, there is only abundance. To think health when surrounded by the appearances of disease, or to think riches when in the midst of appearances of poverty, requires power. But he who acquires this power becomes a mastermind. He can conquer fate, he can have what he wants. This power can only be acquired by getting hold of the basic fact which is behind all appearances, and that fact is that there is one thinking substance, from which and by which all things are made. Then we must grasp the truth that every thought held in this substance becomes a form, and that man can so impress his thoughts upon it as to cause them to take form and become visible things. When we realize this, we lose all doubt and fear. For we know that we can create what we want to create. We can get what we want to have and can become what we want to be. As a first step toward getting rich, you must believe the three fundamental statements given previously in this chapter. And in order to emphasize them, I repeat them here. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made and which in its original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces a thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought, and by impressing his thought upon form of the substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. You must lay aside all other concepts of the universe than this monistic one, and you must dwell upon this until it is fixed in your mind and has become your habitual thought. Read these creed statements over and over again. Fix every word upon your memory, and meditate upon them until you firmly believe what they say. If a doubt comes to you, cast it aside as a sin. Do not listen to arguments against this idea. Do not go to churches or lectures where a contrary concept of things is taught or preached. Do not read magazines or books which teach you a different idea. If you get mixed up in your faith, all your efforts will be in vain. Do not ask why these things are true, nor speculate as to how they can be true. Simply take them on trust. The science of getting rich begins with the absolute acceptance of this faith. Chapter 5. Increasing Life You must get rid of the last vestige of the old idea that there is a deity whose will it is that you should be poor, or whose purposes may be served by keeping you in poverty. The intelligent substance which is all and in all, and which lives in all and lives in you, is a consciously living substance. Being a consciously living substance, it must have the nature and inherent desire of every living intelligence for increase of life. It is forever becoming more. It must do so if it continues to be at all. Intelligence is under this same necessity for continuous increase. Every thought we think makes it necessary for us to think another thought. Consciousness is continually expanding. Every fact we learn leads us to the learning of another fact. Knowledge is continually increasing. Every talent we cultivate brings to the mind the desire to cultivate another talent. We are subject to the urge of life, seeking expression, whichever drives us on to know more, to do more, and to be more. In order to know more, do more, and be more, we must have more. We must have things to use, for we learn and do and become only by using things. We must get rich so that we can live more. The desire for riches is simply the capacity for larger life-seeking fulfillment. Every desire is the effort of an unexpressed possibility to come into action. It is power seeking to manifest which causes desire. 
That which makes you want more money is the same as that which makes the plant grow. It is life, seeking fuller expression. The one living substance must be subject to this inherent law of all life. It is permeated with the desire to live more. That is why it is under the necessity of creating things. The one substance desires to live more in you. Hence, it wants you to have all the things you can use. It is the desire of God that you should get rich. He wants you to get rich because he can express himself better through you if you have plenty of things to use in giving him expression. He can live more in you if you have unlimited command of the means of life. The universe desires you to have everything you want to have. Nature is friendly to your plans. Everything is naturally for you. Make up your mind that this is true. It is essential, however, that your purpose should harmonize with the purpose that is in all. You must want real life, not mere pleasure of sensual gratification. Life is the performance of function, and the individual really lives only when he performs every function, physical, mental, and spiritual, of which he is capable, without excess in any. You do not want to get rich in order to live swinishly, for the gratification of animal desires, that is not life. But the performance of every physical function is a part of life, and no one lives completely who denies the impulses of the body a normal and healthful expression. You do not want to get rich solely to enjoy mental pleasures, to get knowledge, to gratify ambition, to outshine others, to be famous. All of these are a legitimate part of life, but the man who lives for the pleasures of the intellect only will only have a partial life, and he will never be satisfied with his lot. You do not want to get rich solely for the good of others, to lose yourself for the salvation of mankind, to experience the joys of philanthropy and sacrifice. The joys of the soul are only a part of life, and they are no better or nobler than any other part. You want to get rich in order that you may eat, drink, and be merry, when it is time to do these things, in order that you may surround yourself with beautiful things, see distant lands, feed your mind, and develop your intellect, in order that you may love men and do kind things, and be able to play a good part in helping the world to find truth. But remember that extreme altruism is no better and no nobler than extreme selfishness. Both are mistakes. Get rid of the idea that God wants you to sacrifice yourself for others, and that you can secure his favor by doing so. God requires nothing of the kind. What he wants is that you should make the most of yourself, for yourself and for others, and you can help others more by making the most of yourself than in any other way. You can make the most of yourself only by getting rich, so it is right and praiseworthy that you should give your first and best thought to the work of acquiring wealth. Remember, however, that the desire of substance is for all, and his movements must be for more life to all. It cannot be made to work for less life to any, because it is equally in all seeking riches and life. Intelligent substance will make things for you, but it will not take things away from someone else and give them to you. You must get rid of the thought of competition. You are to create, not to compete for what is already created. You do not have to take anything away from anyone. You do not have to drive sharp bargains. You do not have to cheat or to take advantage. You do not need to let any man work for you for less than he earns. You do not have to covet the properties of others or to look at it with wishful eyes. No man has anything of which you cannot have the like, and that without taking what he has away from him. You are to become a creator not a competitor. You are going to get what you want, but in such a way that, when you get it, every other man will have more than he has now. I am aware that there are men who get a vast amount of money by proceeding in direct opposition to the statements in the paragraph above, and may add a word of explanation here. Men of the plutocratic type, who become very rich, do so sometimes purely by their extraordinary ability on the plane of competition, and sometimes they unconsciously relate themselves to substance in his great purposes and movements for the general racial upbuilding through industrial evolution.
Rockefeller, Carnegie, Morgan have been the unconscious agents of the Supreme in the necessary work of systematizing and organizing productive industry. And in the end, their work will contribute immensely toward increased life for all. Their day is nearly over. They have organized production and will soon be succeeded by the agents of the multitude who will organize the machinery of distribution. The multimillionaires are like the monster reptiles of the prehistoric eras. They play a necessary part in the evolutionary process, but the same power which produced them will dispose of them. Riches secured on the competitive plane are never satisfactory and permanent. They are yours today and another's tomorrow. Remember, if you are to become rich in a scientific and certain way, you must rise entirely out of the competitive thought. You must never think for a moment that the supply is limited. Just as soon as you begin to think that all the money is being cornered and controlled by bankers and others, and that you must exert yourself to get laws passed to stop this process, and so on, in that moment you drop into the competitive mind and your power to cause creation is gone for the time being. And what is worse, you will probably arrest the creative movements you have already instituted. Know that there are countless millions of dollars worth of gold in the mountains of the earth, not yet brought to light. And know that if there were not, more would be created from thinking substance to supply your needs. Know that the money you need will come, even if it is necessary, for a thousand men to be led to the discovery of new gold mines tomorrow. Never look at the visible supply. Look always at the limitless riches in formless substance, and know that they are coming to you as fast as you can receive and use them. Nobody, by cornering the visible supply, can prevent you from getting what is yours. So never allow yourself to think for an instant that all the best building spots will be taken before you get ready to build your house, unless you hurry. Never worry about the trusts and combines, and get anxious for fear that they will come to own the whole earth. Never get afraid that you will lose what you want because some other person beats you to it. That cannot possibly happen. You are not seeking anything that is possessed by anybody else. You are causing what you want to be created from formless substance, and the supply is without limits. Stick to the formulated statement. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which in its original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought, and by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. 